The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. So hey everyone, uh, my name is Janil Dalal and I'm currently a technical writer slash embedded Linux engineer at Intel. Uh, I work on the new open source board that they're coming up with called the Minnow board. And I'm also going to be having a booth uh, after this talk and we're going to be giving away one free Minnow board in the raffle with some other goodies from Intel. Uh, so uh, the talk is on Caden Live. So before I start, I just want to get a quick background info of how many of you actually do video editing as a hobby, so as a professional, and what are you looking for from this talk? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm a professional. I've been working in media uh, basically my main career most of my life. Uh, I've watched the evolution from analog into digital. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm still looking for a solution that will let me get off of Mac because uh, Mac is turning into a walled garden and I don't want to be there. I see. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? So basically, uh, I just want to get a little, because this talk is uh, mostly like a beginner kind of thing. Uh, it just gets you started, like how you use Caden Live, and it's just going to talk some simple stuff. Uh, but I'm sure that you guys will also learn a lot of new stuff on the way. Um, so there are a lot of video editors in Linux. Uh, there's OpenShot, there's a Cinderella, and, but I personally uh, haven't used those as much, but when I just first started with Caden Live, that was it. I mean, it just saw all the purpose that I had. And the reason was that I was just, as a hobby, I used to make a lot of video tutorials on, like if I, let's say, install one software, then I would like to, you know, take a screencast and do some editing, or if I'm making a video on Arduino, how you would do something on the Arduino, then for those kind of hobbies purposes, I was looking for a video editor in Linux, and those were my basic needs when I started with Caden Live. So, first let's start with the basic problem. Uh, now, there are a lot of video editors, but uh, when, you, when you're not in that field and you're in some other field, uh, there's always some struggle with uh, the software, the UI, and uh, without you spending like 10 hours just trying to take a crash course on that software, you want something that you can quickly start with. Uh, like I said, yes, you need a simple and clean, intuitive UI with a lot of features that can not only solve your hobby's purposes, but at the same time, it also works for a professional who's, who's trying to use the tool. And yes, it has to be free and open source and not restricted to Windows. So just a quick history about Caden Live. So the project was initially started by Jason Wood in 2002, and then now they have a, a small team of developers who are maintaining this project. And they also had a successful fundraising, uh, I think in the past uh, month or so, and that's really gonna help them. And they also have a bounty feature where if they want some features uh, introduced into the software, then they offer some money to do that. Uh, but you're obviously welcome to contribute if you can do in any part of the software. What language is development? Uh, yeah, exactly, yes. So just a few of the awesome Caden Live features. So the way I'm going to do this, I'm quickly going to go over the slides and like, you know, do a quick overview, and then I'm just going to start up my Caden Live, and we're actually going to take a video audio file and do some hands-on projects. So it supports a wide range of camcorders and cameras. Then uh, also, it, it, the whole Caden Live is based on the FFmpeg and the MLT framework, and because of that, it supports a wide variety of formats that you normally would see in the industry. Uh, there's a lot of effects and transitions. Um, you can also add your custom effects and transitions. Uh, yes, you have configurable keyboard shortcuts and the interface layouts, depending on what kind of interface you would want to see more and what you would not want to see, you can just stack it to the side. Uh, yes, and this is obviously a standard feature that you know you have video and audio organizing layers, and, and it's, it, you can add as many layers uh, for audio and video as you want. There's no restriction. So let's go over the Caden Live installation. So you, Caden Live supports almost all flavors of uh, the Linux distribution, and it also supports FreeBSD and Mac OS X. 
uh, but I currently use Ubuntu, 12, I mean X Ubuntu 12.10, so I'm just going to be covering the installation for Ubuntu variants. You can install this from source also. And uh, they also have repositories for almost all major distributions, but I would recommend installing via PPA because uh, like the latest stable version as of now is 0.9.6. If you see the repositories, it's going to be probably 0.9.2 or 0.9.4. So what this means is that there's going to be a few bugs that have not been fixed in that old version. So it's really recommended that you use the latest stable version. So it's just a simple line, just one simple line. You add the PPA, then you just do the install, and that installs it for you. If you're not normally, normally working in a KDE environment, does that have to load the entire thing, or does it work off of a small uh, It just, uh, like, I, uh, yes, sir. So I have XFCE, so it just uh, installs the minimum KDE libraries that we need, not the whole KDE thing. But because I'm doing by the PPA, that's why it's installing that. But I mean, if you were to like, you know, build from source or install from that, I'm probably sure it's not going to install all the other external dependencies. Does the PPA include the uh, dependencies? Yes. So the task that I had in mind was for today, where this first, we're going to understand the layout of the software, then how you can, you know, cut the clip at different parts, then how you add different effects to the clip then how you can remove the sound and add your own custom sound to that video, uh, then merging two videos, uh, then the title, what is the title clip, and finally the rendering part. Okay, so this, yeah. So this is, I have Caden uh, Live 0.9.6. And so this is your, okay, is it, is, it, is it visible from there? Okay. So you, the, where my mouse is currently, this is the project tree. So the way this works is that first, whenever you start your project, you first want to import every sound clip, every video clip that you want to work with first over here. So let's say that, so basically what I'm trying to say is that you can also, so Project tree is your, basically your bank or source from where you import everything. And from there, whatever changes you want to do or whatever uh, clip you want to work with, you just select it from there. Then this is, basically your time, this is basically your timeline, what you see at the bottom over here. As you can see, you have different video and audio layers. So this is where you would drag stuff. So whichever clip you want to work on, you would just drag it from the project tree over to the timeline. So until and unless you don't drag the clip or the sound file from the project tree to the timeline, it's not going to do anything to that. Then over here, you have the effect list, various different effect lists based on the genre. So you have a lot of different effects for audio, then uh, audio correction. Then effect stack is the list of effects that have been applied to a video. So you can keep a tab of what effect is being currently applied and which is not. And finally, this is the transition. So when you have two or three different videos and you want to uh, have some kind of cool animation or transition between them, this is what you're going to be using. And this is your clip monitor, this is your project monitor, and this is your record monitor. So most of now, we're just going to be concerned with the clip monitor. So that's going to be playing your current video that you just selected. So yeah, I think I covered most of the layouts, yeah. Anyone have any questions so far? Okay. So first, let's import our first file. And you can, uh, so the other thing was that um, often you're going to be asked to select the profile. So by default, it selects the appropriate profile for your video, depending on what, what, is the inform or what type of video you have. And if, if you're not sure exactly that the video that you have with you, what is the frame rate, what is the resolution, then there's something called media info. 
Yeah, media info. So you just fire up this software called media info, and let's say, let's just open a file here. Open a file. So, OK, so for, for example, if I open this video, open this file, then it just gives me the information that, OK, what is the frame rate? What is the resolution? And information about the audio and the video as well, in case you're not sure exactly about the, the video file that you have. Yes, sir? Do all the media for your project need to be consistent with the same format, or does it do some conversion format? Yeah, it does some conversion. So it's not necessarily that every video you have has to be like, you know, if, if let's say one video is 1024 into 768, it doesn't mean that all the other videos have to be like that. So basically, just take the first video, and then it uh, adjusts the profile to that. But as, as you keep on adding stuff, when you finally want to uh, produce your output file, you have a choice to select. Which is the optimum size you want to, do you want to have it for a full HDTV, or do you want to have it for you know, just a small you know, laptop or something? So this is just a small video that I have. So as you can see in the clip monitor, you, you, can, you can preview this file over here. This is just a small video of an office. So now we'll just import another audio track. So first, we're just going to work with these two files. So now that I, I know that I want to work with these two files, I'm just going to import them to the timeline. So this is my video. And now, so based on where you keep on dragging this mouse over here, you can see the preview over there. And if you don't like you know, this being too big, then you can always just you know, like adjust based on your need. You can just adjust this, or I can uh, probably make this bigger. and make this more small. And then can you break it up in any of the ones that are used? Can you manipulate them as individual segments? Uh, so so basically yeah, you can undock them. You, you can just remove that if you don't want it. And like you know now I am sure that this is the way I want this layout to be. So you can just save this layout. I already you know sorry save layout or save layout too. So every time you start then you know you just save this layout so you make sure that okay you don't have to start the settings again and if you just close this thing, it's just going to go away, basically. So, so this is your video file. And so first, what you're going to do is first, we're going to work with the audio. So now, I don't like the audio in this part. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click here. And then I'm going to split the audio. So as you can see at the bottom, it, it has inserted this audio file over here. But as of now, it has not removed the audio file. The audio file is still. Uh, stuck with that thing. So if you just play the file right here, it still plays that. So what we need to do is we need to ungroup the clips. So now what we've done is we've taken the video file and we split the audio from the video file. So now this is different. So basically now if you play this, wait a second, yeah. So now the audio is still playing. So now if I delete this audio, it's gone. So remove the audio. And something else I'm going to recommend is that this is a very stable software, but occasionally there's a lot of crashes, and I have experienced this. I'm working like 90% done with the project, and suddenly crashes. And most of my work is sometimes gone. So whenever you're doing something, with, make sure that you just keep on saving it. So now we got the audio done. So now we want to add this audio. So this is from the movie Oblivion, actually. So now you get your audio there. And so now, you know, now once you have your audio done, now let's say that you just want to have the audio till one minute. And after that, you want to clip off the audio. So all you got to do is you just got to click on the audio file and then press, I think, Control R, I think. No, it's Shift R. Yeah. So if you, if you take it to the point, you just select the clip. Like, let's say you want to clip the audio file. So you just take it to that point and then at the, at the desired location, just press uh, Shift R, and that's going to split the clip. So now, as you can see, these two are separate. And I could probably just you know, delete this part, and after one minute, there's no audio. And now you can do mix and match. So basically, what you could do is, uh, after one minute, you want to have some other soundtrack. So you can add another soundtrack based on your need. Uh, 
you, you can convert that to mono, uh, but um, I think for, for that you need to use Audacity or something because I tried one time uh, just recently converting this uh, studio to mono and I don't, I don't think it worked out for me. And yeah, then there's also the zoom button. So I mean, basically, if, if, if you want to go down to the detail, like when you have like four, five, six different clips, so you, that time you'd probably be using the zoom function, which we go over in detail. So that time you would want to use the zoom function to go to the minute detail of the clip. And also this tools that I'm using, like, you know, you can also use the razor tool. I mean, the, the, the shortcut I told you is just to, you know, simplify and not use this every time. So that was for the audio part. So now we're also going to get one more video. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And then you did a save shortly after, and right now you've got some other audio track in there. Um, yes. Is the program truly saving a complete knitted um, audio video, video file, or is it really saving a representation of what it will later export as a... The second option, what you're mentioning right now. The second option. That is just, uh, it's not actually like, you know, if you're working with big files, it's not going to do all the exact changes there and there. Like if I remove some audio, or if I do something, it's not going to make the changes there. Like, OK, let's say I take a big video and remove the audio. Right. And the, it's not going to do that. It's just going to make a note, OK, you know what? When the final project is supposed to be exported, right. you're supposed to do like this. And that's one of the reasons why it takes so long for rendering. Like, like you know, if I have a big video for in this machine, it takes about 15 to 20 minutes. And this is an i7 dual core. Uh, so basically, let's say, let's say, this, let's say like you want the project to be as it is. Like you just want to now produce a movie from this thing. So when you go to project and then you go to render, this is the final thing where you select. So okay, you know what? I'm, I want to have an MPEG-4 format, uh, and then I want the audio to be MP3. So you select your video rate, your audio rate, then other different options, and then you just render to file. So once you click that, it generates your file. Yeah, so feel free to ask any questions in between. I think that would be much better. Yes, yes. So it's like, a, um, like, okay, yeah, let me show the feature, yeah, it's a good uh, thing. To extend my question a little bit, is it fair to say that when you make a project active, uh, it, it has already divided the components out for the purpose of, of the program management? Well, from your view, it has not, I mean, from the, the user view, it has not split it, but internally it has split it, so... So, I mean, if you want to split the audio and video, I mean, it internally might have done that, but for you, you've got to specifically tell it that I don't want the audio and video together. I want to remove this thing and add another thing. Mm -hmm. So you still got to say, but as to the user, it does, it's all done in the back end, so. Right. The, basically, all these programs just keep track of where the media came from and don't actually affect or recreate or make copies of the media. So coming back to your question, so basically I could, let's say that this is my soundtrack, and my soundtrack is, let's say, this big, okay? And my video is not that big, so I can just extend it over here, you know, right? Hold on. Yeah, so yeah, so you, I think, yeah, you can do that for the soundtrack, but I'm not sure exactly if you can do it for the video. Your agenda is Yeah, yeah, so what he was asking is that, I mean, if I could extend that and have some kind of blank frames there at the end to match, like, if the video is 10 seconds uh, longer than the audio. You can reduce definitely the size. I mean, like, let's say that the soundtrack is just till, hold on a sec. It's just till here, right? And I read it's too long, and you really don't want that. So you could just, like, you know, reduce it till here, so. Yeah. Okay. 
So okay, so let's just do some effect on this video first. So you go to the effect list, and let's see in the color one, okay? So let's say we want to do a grayscale of the whole thing. So what you do is you just take this thing and drag it over here. And when you play it again, So the whole thing is in grayscale. And, and this is just uh, like, you know, what I would do is like, you know, if I wanted uh, the grayscale effect just till 39 seconds, for example, then I would just split the clip. So what would I do is I would just apply the effect on this part right here. So I would just take this feature and apply it over here and not over here. So when I join them again, you know, uh, this still has the effect applied to it. But um, if I just select the uh, Okay, so now what is happening is, what I did was I applied the grayscale effect to 39 seconds, and after that, I don't have the grayscale effect. So you, you can actually choose uh, for what duration you want the effect and for what duration you don't want the effect. And then you can typically dissolve between the two, right? Yes. Yes. So that's another effect. Let's let's do that. Yeah. I'm just, I was just trying to quickly go over some effects. So this is this is one from the color effect. I'm trying to. I did use one the one you mentioned about the slow motion. I'm just not able to recollect where it was actually. Uh, yeah, that's in transition. I'm just trying to find his effect. Uh, if we can find it here. Yes. Let's see. Your fading effect right here. So this was some of the fix. So now the where the transitions come in is actually. Let's add another video first. So now I'm going to add this to the second layer. Let's say I'm starting from here. So. Now let's zoom in. So this is where the zoom in feature comes in. So it's over here that you decide where exactly do you want the second video to merge in with the, second, uh, you know, the first video. So once you have them lay, laid out properly, what you can do is you, you're going to see a green. Let me, let me zoom in more. So you can see over here, once, once you click over here, you're going to see uh, this, this green thing pop up over here. This is the, by default, the dissolve effect. So what's going to happen is, so this is the thing that you were talking about. So it just, well, you know, uh, fades the first video, and then the second video starts gaining popularity. So if I replay that thing. And you have a lot of different transitions. Like, you know, you can have divide, multiply, overlay. Um, you can also have, let, OK, let's try the burn effect. And you can also adjust the size of this transition, like how much do you want it? Do you want to reduce it further? Uh, and then accordingly, you just move the second video file in respect to that, the green transition layer. So let's, let's just try one more effect. Let's say overlay. So this just overlays the, uh, the second video with the first one. So there's a lot of cool effects. And it's basically just about like which kind of effect you want. And uh, you just uh, try the different effects out. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. in JPEG, mm -hmm. I'd like to get import them into a tool and then produce a, uh, a video with that. Yeah, you can do that. Can you do that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so basically what I would do is, uh, right now I just imported a clip, right? So I need to find a video, I mean, sorry, uh, a picture that I have to import. Hold on a second. Let's see. Pictures, pictures, pictures. I mean, without clicking a thousand times. Ah, uh, yes, I understand. So hold on a second.
So you're talking about importing, like, you know, so basically the, the file manager, basically, if you're just selecting all the files, like, like, like I'm selecting all five files, then it just imports the whole thing right there. Yeah. And then, again, same thing, I just select all these files and I just drag them on all the way here. So as you can see right now, what it did was, it just had, like, let's say the default duration is five seconds. So it just uh, placed one file after the other file for five seconds and yeah, so you can just select like thousand of them and just drag them to one video layer and it's done. But you need like a pretty decent machine uh, for the rendering part, I would say. So, yeah, so I just quickly want to just cover the, the rendering part first so then we can explore more stuff. Yeah. So now let's say this is, this is how exactly I want the part. Uh, you know, when we had one effect and we have one soundtrack and the other video. So you just go to project and then you just click render. So this is where you just decide, like, you know, and now again for this, you need to have the Kden Live itself doesn't have all the libraries and everything. It depends on other open source projects. So if you don't have, let's say, some version of the FFmpeg library, like, you know, that you don't have the MP4, uh, you know, libraries to play that file, then basically that, that part would be blocked out here. You can't export to that format. But that being said, let's say you want to select MPEG2, then you can just, you know, name your video whatever you want here. And then you select the video rate, which depending, that's why I had told you about the media info. So let's say that your original video is, uh, the video rate is 12,000, then you want to keep it at that format because if the original source file only has X amount of information, you can't use any tool to make that 2X. If it just has a, if it has like, let's say your video file is uh, semi-HD, like 720p and not full HD, then you can't, even if you export to 180p, it's not going to make that full HD. So that's one thing I want to make clear um, uh, that, you know. You can't add resolution. Yeah, yeah, you can't add resolution. You just got to want to make sure that whatever your source file is, keep it in that same resolution. Otherwise, you're just wasting your space. And this is your audio rate. And the other thing was that this is a two pass filter. So I was just quickly experimenting with this with this a few, a few days back. So what this does is that if I don't select this, what it does is, it directly renders this in the format that you mentioned. But if you select two pass, what I think it actually does is it first, in the first pass, it collects information about, like, you know, kind of like a feedback about the whole the setup that you have. And in the second pass, it optimizes its, its, its uh, rendering procedure based on the, in the, in the information that it collected in the first pass. And yes, it's going to take more time compared to doing a direct one pass. And yeah, that's about it. And when you just press render to file, it's going to do that, and so with 8 GB of RAM, and I'm just running XFC, and this thing is i7 dual core, it's taking 10 minutes, so uh, it's pretty uh, high on the resource, I would say. Does it thread that? Is that you still working? Yeah, so that's a very good feature I actually didn't mention. I actually forgot to do that, so I'll just come back to you one minute, just uh, So right now my encoder threads are two because mine is just a dual core. Uh, so if you had Quarkle, you probably put this to four to make sure that you utilize all of your processor cores. Z over here, that's two. I can just reduce it to one. You can see like my fan noise is coming out actually because it's using the whole thing. It's not gonna like you know run out of space or something. It's just gonna take more time. But at the same time, like let's say I'm doing a, I have this you know PDF running in the background, and let's say we had like ten different videos or ten different audios, and I'm trying to do some other stuff in the back end. What's gonna happen is it's gonna crash the whole thing. So basically, your project's lost. I mean, it's saved, but the rendering thing is closed. So what I would do is like if I had a big project, I would just leave it overnight and probably just see the progress in the morning. Um, yeah, that's a good. I think I think you need to write a custom script for that. I haven't. Uh, so that, that's what the script part is for, actually. So you can have like your script to do uh, custom rendering. But I haven't tried that part. Some formats can concatenate directly on top of each other, and others cannot. They have to be re-rendered anyway. So 
And if, if that's the case, though, you would just re render out the parts, take them back into Haiti and Live or whatever measure you're using, and then export them to the same resolution, and that would just concatenate them and won't be rendered. It shouldn't be rendered for, for you know, it shouldn't take very long to be rendered for content resolution the same video. And it has tools, like, you know, like tools in the sense it's linked with tools. So let's say that you want to do some, you have opened up KDE and you, you, you're Kaden Live and you're doing some stuff in it and you want to somehow edit some audio file. So you can actually link Audacity with this uh, software and then you know, do that audio part and then go back to Kaden Live. Or let's say you want to add a title clip, you want to add a graphic file. Just a minute, sir. So you can actually, um, it, it, it'll open GIMP for you and then you can do that part and then put this right back in. So like, let's say we add a, uh, add a title clip. So we're here. So it, it has a, the menu where you know now I can add text over here, or uh, let's say what I want. Um, wait a second. So you can add image. Let's see. One second. Yeah. Show background. So now here, I can just make my own bio, own kind of custom image. And you know, so this is the actual background in which uh, the whole thing is paused right now. And then I can have my custom image over here. I can add my own text. And depending on that, you know, that would be a title clip. So something you would put on top, like, like let's say during the, in between the video, you want to add a feature, step two. Then this is what you would do. You would add a title clip at that part and write down, this is step two. Yes, sir, you had a question? I'll just take a shot and how yeah, you can. I'm going to take over this one and uh, just explain. All these video editing processes only work from uh, references to your original files. None of them overwrite the file in the rendering process or anything like that. So when you go to render, you're creating a new process. If it crashes, you go back to the project file, try to figure out what made it crash, and then try to re render again and create a new file from that. It's called non destructive editing. Yeah, yeah, that, that's correct. That's the term, yeah. So basically, you're, you're ensuring, even in the worst case, if you forgot to save the file, I think it has a feature where it automatically saves it for some time. So a couple of times when I did not save it and it crashed, right? It has a recovery option where it tries to recover to the last uh, save point checkpoint and bring your features back. So if your rendering fails, that's no problem. You can it gives you you can find out the error, maybe some library file is missing, what the problem is, and then you can just go back to that state where you had everything set up perfectly fine. Yes, sir. Well, the thing is that this thing is actually um, i7-2610M, this mobile processor. So this thing only has, again, two cores, like your i5. So as far as I would say the speed, the main difference I would find in your laptop that has i5 dual core and my dual core is that my clock speed is probably going to be more than yours. So. Hyperthreading. Yeah. So yes. Yeah, so in this case, uh, I would have two cores and four threads. So I could probably go the extra mile and put that. 
Yeah, yeah, but I would probably just do half of the thing because what, I have, what like he said, is that you know if, if you're too ambitious and you just use up the whole thing and uh, and you try to open up something else and it's using all the four threads, then it's gonna crash. Oh, so if you're over 90, you probably yeah, over 90, yeah, that's fine, yeah, 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 yes. So the question is, uh, if you want to take this uh, setup mobile, like let's say you have the setup here and then you would take it somewhere else. So the one way would be to, which I think would be the, uh, the one that came to my mind, is that you would first save your project file. You take that on a pen drive. And then you take all your source file, like the audio, video, images, whatever that is. And then, and then again, open that file, that project file, and then just specify the paths to where those video files are again. And that probably would replicate the entire setting because it, it just has a list of steps what it's going to do to, for the rendering. So. So, it was relevant. so if the project, if your media files are in the same folder as a project file, you can just kind of move around without it taking up space in the system. Yes. So I have some couple of questions for you, uh, you know, from Hobby's point of view. A uh, couple of guys who saw Caden Live for the first time, how did you find the UI? Was it intuitive? Was it a little bit overwhelming, complex, too many menus? Uh, what was your feedback on that? Oh, nice. <laughs> I see. What resolution? Uh, HD. I took the translation video from uh, my Windows side on, applied a blur, and then redid the, a new render scheme to it with a plain effect. A lot of the rendering time would be, it depends on how many effects you put, depends on how many complexity you're affecting. And something else I want to show here is that I mean, often there's going to be some limitation to what every tool can do. And it's eventually a mix of you do this part from this tool, this part from this tool, and then I eventually just add clubbing them together in Caden Live. So for example, um, you know you often see all these animated videos in Gmail and all that, you know, that they, they make them for Epiphany Studios. And they give me a quotation of $50,000 just to make a two minute animated video. Uh, and then I'm just going to show you the same video that I made using an online site. Uh, for almost like 30 bucks, yeah. So this is a kind of a hacker space I'm trying, trying to open in India. So this was made completely using a drag and drop UI. I don't know anything about Flash, and I have not used Flash for this thing. Uh, but I just took the video and then had some final minute cuts using Kden Live where I needed them. So I'll just show you quickly the website. Uh, it took me about 30 minutes, I would say, the first time getting used to the UI they had. So it's called, I'm not sure if my net's going to be working here. So it's called Powtoons. Yeah, yeah, I don't have the network working here. So it's, it's powtoon, P-O-W-T-O-O-N.com. 
so by default, if you don't want the branding, it's free. I don't have anything to do with them. It's just something cool that I found, so I thought I might share. So by default, if you, if you don't want to pay any money, it, it gives you the file in 480p. And it, at the end, it's going to have like a stamp created using Powtoons. So you're basically paying money for a higher resolution and removing their branding. So, so th this way you can get like professional type of videos and you know and not pay someone some flash animator a lot of money to make them. And regarding the this this uh, presentation that I had, I made that using uh, Beamer, Latex Beamer. Um, so that's also a very cool software. I kind of like the nice dots at the top and everything. In uh, Kindle Live, yes. Yes, you can. And also, I would like to acknowledge the entire, oh, damn. Yeah, so yeah, sorry. Southeast Linux West, entire staff and team members for their support and you know, uh, their help and everything. You're asking where you don't want to. So basically, the question is how to add like you know three kind of effects in Blender, but using Kid and Live. Spin in, yeah. So with 2D, I think it's possible, but what 3D you're mentioning is uh, the best solution that I can think of uh, in my realm would be just do that part in Blender. I know, I mean, if you don't know Blender, and then just export it to Kid and Live and or some other tool. That's basically what I do. And these are some of the resources, like you have the Kid and Live manual, the forum where you can ask questions. And they have this tutorial part where they uh, collect all, everyone who's made a video tutorial on Kid and Live. And then you have a vast collection of videos that you can just watch and uh, get some information. Yeah, you can also use their IRC channel. Pardon me? I think it's free node, yeah. Yeah. I haven't used their IRC that much. I usually found my answers in the forums or, or in the videos. How stable or unstable is it really? I mean, uh, when I first started using, when I first started using, I think it was 0 0.9, I think something, yeah, 0 0.8, 6, something like that. It was very crashy. It used to crash. And this was about like a year back, and I had a lot of problems. Uh, but I just used it just because I was getting my stuff done. But with this latest, the, the, re, the latest release that I'm using right now, it's, it's pretty stable. So far, not a single crash. Unless I'm trying to overburden it with, like, you know, probably you know, having 15 tabs open in my browser and then doing something there and then having this thing rendered in the background. It's using the same back. It's Dan Denny, right? That, or Kenny that wrote the back end MELT. Is the MLT framework? MELT, yeah. The MLT yeah, framework. it's using the MLT framework, yes. Yeah. It's also used in OpenShot and some of the other ed editors now, and it was kind of mm -hmm. new two years ago. But, yeah. But he, he wrote uh, DD Grab and a bunch of other stuff that's been around for a long time. Yeah. But I'm pretty amazed with, I mean, it, it's, it's nice. I mean, yes, you cannot get a professional type like, you know, you would expect in a, you know, a movie-like type, like in the effects. That probably for that, you would need to use some Windows side tools. But from a hobby's point of view and for just getting my work done, I think Kaden Live pretty much does my, does my job that I need to do. Yeah, so the other thing, like I mentioned, is why I recommend using the PPA is that it, it, that has the latest version and your repository is not going to have. So, so it's stable. I'm not saying it's not stable, but there's like few minor bugs. Like uh, one of my friends had that bug where he had some issue with the UI, some, something would not work. So that was just an issue with that version that you're just using. So my take is if it works for you, if there's no problem, then stick to that version. But if, if there's some problem that's, you're just facing on that thing, that then probably means that it was probably solved in the newer version. So in that case, you would probably move on to the latest version. But in terms of features, it's probably much the same. 
Anyone have any other questions or something? Um, yeah. Do you do a quick overlay or text title actual and show it happening over the over your video for a moment? Uh, yes. Because I, I didn't quite we didn't quite get to that step. We talked about adding pictures and stuff to the title pages. Yeah. Do those show up as an effect or as a transition or how do those show up? In the yeah, I understand what you're saying. No, I understand. Does it support subtitle in the sense? Yeah, so in subtitle in the sense it would basically, like I mentioned, I would just be adding title clips at different parts. Yeah, so I would just add the subtitle clips at different parts. Yeah, the trick with that stuff is trying to automate some of it. And the scripting might open up that possibility. So what you first do is you just first show show background. So actually know that at this point where you put your cursor here, so at this point where my cursor is, Okay, I can't, yeah, great. So at this point, what is the background basically? So that's why you would do show background to know, okay, this is how it's gonna look. And then you just click on text. So let's say, hello, how are you? And then I would want the size to be 100, let's say. Maybe 200 if I'm too ambitious. No, that's too much. 130, okay, that, this looks good, yeah. So once I'm done with this thing, I just put it over here. Drag it down to the, so, the, so the, okay, yeah. Got it. So now you just click okay. So now what's gonna happen is, let's see, if everything went correctly. Yeah, hold on. Right. Oh, okay, okay, so the, the, the title clip, you again got to export it here, so now let's say export title clip right here. Does you actually need to put it above? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do, yeah. So you got to drag this thing at the bottom. Yeah. Or you know what, I can just probably do this at some place else. Like maybe this part where it's not, nothing is there. Mm -hmm. And this is your transition that you're going to be using. So let's see how the default transition is. So hold on. So what I want to do is I will probably do alpha x over. So now, or alpha x or, yeah. Yeah. So I'm just going to do that. Yeah, I probably need to fine tune it to make sure that it's you know. So it just uh, creates a clip, and you can do pretty much anything you want with it. Yeah. You can add, you know, subtitles. So when I'm making like any Ubuntu videos, I'll probably have step two installing, you know, probably example Firefox and, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yes, it does that. Yeah, we, I actually did this too. Uh, uh, like what you mentioned, you have a green background, and you know, yeah, it supports that. So you can have your own custom background. You'd be like, you know, you'd be in space, and yeah, <laughs> yeah. I forgot one of the, if all of you are watching this YouTube video, so there's a, I have him on Google Plus, this guy, he's very well known for, he's an, he, he makes the videos for XDA developers and also on uh, Ubuntu and some other stuff. Uh, I forgot his name, but um, he's pretty well known in the community. I'm not able to recollect his name, but he basically uses Caden Live for his uh, video. Jordan. Exactly, yes, that's the guy. Uh, so the question was that I, I was uh, trying to tell is that there's a very well-known guy in the community called Jordan Keys. So even for his uh, videos, he uses Caden Live. Uh, have you compared this with OpenShot and found it to be, or, uh, well, have you compared it with OpenShot? And if so, uh, is it, has, it, has it worked for you? Does it compare well? Or? Uh, the question is, have I compared it with OpenShot or not? So I haven't, I mean, I, I can't do, do the comparison because I haven't given that a fair amount of time to open shot. I just opened it one time or so, and I was like, I'm not going to use it. So, <laughs> and I just stuck with Caden Live. So I, I don't think that would be doing justice without using it for two weeks or so and then probably doing a better comparison. Because the reason was that it just saw all of my purpose. I never had to like look back and start looking for something else. But the thing about OpenShot is with the new uh, funding that they raised, uh, I think on uh, Kickstarter is that they're trying to have a cross-platform version for Mac OS, Windows, and even Linux. Whereas in this case, it's only on Linux. So if some of you guys are using Windows, then... Well, you said it was on Mac OS X as well. Yeah. yeah so but in OpenShot, it's also they're going to make a version for Windows. So it's like truly cross-platform, mm -hmm. which is not still the case in uh, Kaden Live.
So, but yeah, this, feel free to check out my booth, the Minnow board booth I'm going to be having. It's, it's a new open source platform from Intel, based on the Intel Atom processor. What's it, what's it called? The Minnow board. Minnow? Minnow? Yeah, the Minnow board. Like M-I-N-N-O? Yes. W? Yeah, that's correct. Like a little fish. Yeah. Little fish. That's a logo, yeah. Is that available now? Is that a product? Yeah. So, uh, you can order like mid-June, and then you get the deliveries by June end. It's similar to the Panda board and all the other boards, but it, this thing is based on x86. Is it Valley View or Valley, or is it a Cedar Trail Atom processor? Uh, uh, it, it's the, the, the chip series is the E66, uh, E6XX series, so it's not the Clover Trail or the new version that you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot, guys, for attending the talk. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy to implement, easy to use, strong authentication from Wicked. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling.
Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk-based systems, including our own SwitchFox-based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox-based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people. Uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think, 
When you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. And then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think Cloud Stack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the Cloud Stack.